Good morning. Good morning. Let's open in prayer and we'll get prepared for class. Father God, we thank you again for this time that you've allotted for us to go open up the word, to, to understand this theological proposition. And Father, help us to be people of the word above and beyond anything else and foremost, Father. As we look into a theological system, uh, it's hard to say that system should use, be used to determine what we believe. But does that system come out of the Bible? And that's what we're going to investigate this morning as we look more and further into dispensationalism. Father, we want to make sure we honor your son and whatever we do, uh, we, we again dedicate this time to your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're been discussing dispensationalism. This is the fourth class. Um, and let me kind of tell you where we're going to be going in the next couple of classes. Today we're going to look at the, the individual dispensations, most dispensations uh, lists will have. If you took all the lists and put them on top of each other, I'm going to go through every dispensation from their lists, and then we'll talk about different lists. But I think the most important thing that we will get to today, is, and we're, we're, what we're going to do is as we go through the different dispensations, I'm just going to tell you what they are. We're going to take other classes to individually look at each one and see, is it a proposition from the Bible? How man-made is it? And what does it help us to understand uh, how we look at the Bible? Remember, the main reason we're doing this is because we, we want to be uh, very clear how we interpret and understand the Bible. And this is helpful to doing that. I've heard many a testimony uh, in the last couple of months, not just from this congregation, but from other places, that when people understood a dispensational model, it helped them to understand the Bible better. And that's the key. That's the key. Because we are going to go into a little bit, if we get there this morning, into covenant theology. And that, that wraps an enigma in a conundrum. And lo- there's a lot of blurred areas in how they uh, interpret and understand Scripture. So we want to see what they do. Because the only two real theological models uh, that come out of Scripture that kind of are juxtaposition to each other is dispensationalism and covenant theology. However... I think we could be better on both ends being biblical. So we're going to work on all those arenas and see where we can come out. The reason I'm doing this is because when we drop names and, and do names like this, we want to be familiar with terminology. Um, we, however, don't want to be locked into something that we can't see in the Bible. After we do covenant theology, we're going to go into the different dispensations that we're going to discuss this morning a little bit and, and grasp some of that understanding how dispensationalists throughout the ages have come up with these different models. And then you could determine for yourself at some point, are you a, a th- three dispensations, five dispensations, seven, 10, 15, and growing or whatever, um, you know, kind of issue. Uh, one of the things I once said about covenant theology, they hold to, most of them are Calvinists and hold to a thing called tulip. And usually there's five points in tulip, obviously T-U-L-I-P, five points of Calvinism. And some people say that you're a three-point or two-point or whatever. And I said, no, that's you can only be a Calvinist or not. Um, so they hold to five points. What are dispensations? And we'll look at that a little bit. And I think we need to be, uh, what, what I'm trying to do more than anything is educate us on what's out there so you could say, okay, I understand that. I've heard that before. And be good Bereans and check the Word of God. So um, I think I ended last week with this slide. Uh, what are the dispensations? These are the dispensations generally held by a majority of Bible teachers holding to a dispensational theological model. However, they are all man-made. Uh, pretty much. I mean, when you talk about just, if you were to say law, obviously there's a period of law, there's a period of the kingdom. Um, grace has been through all, all the Bible, if you don't know this. Grace is not, we're not in the grace age, because that's kind of, I don't know what, to do with that when there's grace been in the old testament so uh and lots of grace god has always been grace graceful if you don't know that please read the text and we're going to talk about those issues but they tend to be more man-made to fit into a a theological system and what happens sometimes is young kids that go to a seminary that teach a dispensational i don't know if there's one wait a minute that teach a dispensational model um what happens is you usually take that and say, here, i got to overlay it over the Word of God, and then i got to translate it uh, and, and understand it, the Word of God with that model. And don't do that. Don't have a theology going into the Word of God. Be biblical. 
build theology out of Bible study. Everybody kind of clear with that idea? Okay, so what defines a dispensation? This is what most dispensationalists will agree with, what defines a dispensation. So already I have an issue with this because this is what defines it. Uh, it begins with blessing and a new revelation. So if you look at the start, we're going to go through, I think, 10 dispensations this morning. If you look at the start of each one, they're saying there was a blessing that started that. And I could, you could probably say, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Uh, there's, there's a new ruling factor. What's the ruling factor? Obviously, under Adam, what was the ruling factor? God gave Adam how many rules? Two. So there's a ruling factor. For, after Adam, uh, until Moses, what was the ruling factor? And most people say human consciousness, you know, conscious. And I, we'll talk about that. And I say, well, that's, a, that's a big problem anyway, isn't it? Let your conscience be your guide. Didn't Disney make a song out of that? Uh, Thirdly, there's a test. A test is going to assume man can either pass it or fail it, but there's never been a test man can pass. So I don't like, I like being, when I was in school, I like when a teacher graded on a, graded on a curve. Everybody like that? You know, that was really helpful sometimes for a test. Um, God doesn't grade this. He gives you a test and knows you're going to fail, so there's always a failure. Um, but that's assuming man's not man, if you think about it, because man's always going to fail. So then there's a judgment, and the judgment stops that dispensation, and the next one comes in. Obviously, with Adam, we can look real quickly since he's the first in the arena. Adam's judgment was what? He was cast out of Eden, and then two angelic beings uh, kept guard so he couldn't come back in. So that's kind of the basics of understanding what, what defines a dispensational slot, okay? Um, so let's talk about these different dispensations. Um, I'm not going to name them all. We're just going to go through the various ones in order that they appear <clears throat> and give brief understanding of each one. Okay? That's all we're going to do. Uh, so most of most dispensationalists will hold to the dispensation of innocence. Adam to the expulsion from Eden. So that dispensation lasted from Genesis 1 to Genesis 3. Right? You, you, you we're familiar with that. When God had began to say that all was good, that's the blessing. All is good. Uh, God saw that everything was good in the garden. Uh, Adam and Eve were naked and innocent. I don't know why the period's there. Without shame. Should have been a comma, maybe. Um, so when you look at that time period, when you have Adam and Eve in the garden, they were innocent. They hadn't sinned yet. They, were, they didn't have any shame. Uh, we know that sin brings shame. And God walked and talked with them, which was kind of interesting. So when you look at that first dispensation what ended it was the fall so we could put what ends it is the fall and under the fall there was curse curses that was given death physical death had started uh, spiritual death was now a reality remember what adam and eve tried to do after the fall they tried to go out and what cover themselves because they then knew they were naked which means they were shamed before god so they went to cover themselves they didn't know things were started the process of physical death so they took fig leaves which have a shelf life of a couple hours so they sewed fig leaves together and had rotten clothing so they, all of it and they knew so god came down god gave them uh, probably some kind of understanding and a sacrifice he made he killed uh, some animal and made them clothes Okay, so that, that kind of gives the, we'll go in a little bit more in depth at another point in all these. So this is from Adam to the expulsion of Eden. The second one is the uh, dispensation of conscience, human consciousness, uh, let your conscience be your guide. At this point, they understand, it's from the expulsion, let's do it at a time period, from the expulsion from Eden to the flood. So the flood closes out that dispensation. Uh, if you don't know, that's called judgment. <laughs> Uh, what happened during that dis and Genesis? It'd be Genesis 4 through 8. What happened during that dispensation is during this time there is no law. Conscience is left to determine what is good and evil. Remember they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the determining factor is what they knew is good and evil. And we know that the wickedness of man was great. They decided good and evil. We'll just choose what evil and they all got eviler and badder and worser till God sends the flood and God looked out and he said he was sorry that he had made man and he reached out to a guy named Noah and Noah found grace with God 
So that's kind of what that looks at. So that's why it's Genesis. I have Genesis 6-4 in there and the idea of what happened between Adam and Moses. Uh, we talked about it a little Thursday night in our basics class, what happens in between Adam and Moses. There's no law. How is sin imputed where there is no law? But it doesn't mean there was not sin. There was sin. Sin was not held to their account. And basically what man did was wicked. Uh, there was no... Um, no barrier to stop how wicked man would be because they didn't know that this defined God's standards. What defines God's standards was the law. So that's what we have. Human government. Human government would be the next dispensation, Genesis 9 through 12. They get it because Noah got off the ark. And then before, as Abraham came into the picture, we know during that time period, if you know anything about Bible history, this is when the Tower of Babel is put in. Uh, so Noah gets off the ark, and the civilization starts. And if you don't know this, you're all akin to Noah. So if you want to understand anything about Bible, you could put down in your genealogy, since we're doing Matthew next class, you could put down in your chart, somewhere in that tree, Noah. Write down his three sons, and you decide which of the three sons you came from. I came from Shem. Okay? So I could also say I have that in my bloodline. Kind of get that? That's kind of cool if you're writing. I don't know if anybody ever does that on those websites, those kind of things. Where do you go back to? Go back to the ark because they don't believe that, right? They don't believe in this. So, During this time, God gave man the right to govern over the animals and other men. He set up human government. Man was a governing factor in that. Um, what happens is within this time period, God init- uh, in- installs, I guess is the best way to say it, uh, capital punishment. And he also said, he also said to, the main rule he gave to Noah was scatter and replenish the earth. Um, and they didn't. They, they conglomerated basically in one area. And they started making a tower that, that basically, it could either say in the Hebrew that it's tower, the top was the heaven where it would reach God, or the t- they would build it high enough to reach into heaven. I think... The latter would be kind of sketchy because man doesn't really know, even at that time where God resides, and how far you'd have to build it. So, I mean, I don't know. I think what they were basically looking at is uh, their form of worship, what they wanted God to be. It's the first picture of a one-world government, which God says what will happen in the end time. So it's kind of a chiastic understanding. Here's what had happened in that time and what chaos was written, and then there'll be another time that the same a similar, similar thing will occur and it'll be just as chaotic. So that's, that's a picture of human government. Then came a, a dispensation of promise. Um, see, I have issues with certain things because I am an issue full, full person if you don't know that. This is from Adam to Moses from Genesis 12 to Exodus. The problem with this dispensation um, and, and with most of these dispensations, it only includes one group of people. So if you think about a dispensation, it should include the entire world population. Where would you put him in promise? If a promise was given to Abraham and to his family, and through his family the world would be blessed, we know that. But, but the, the promise itself, the idea of promise, was given to Abraham and his descendants. And the final promise, the one that would bless the whole world, is Abraham would have a seed. Okay, and we'll talk about that as we go through Matthew. See how some of these classes kind of tie together? It's kind of cool. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8 and 9 speaks of this period of time in which Abraham looked forward to a time when God would fulfill his promise to Abraham and his family. So Abraham did do that. I don't have an issue with that. Um, But when we look at this, in order for Israel to be blessed, and I want to make this as clear as I can, the nation had to be in Israel. And if you look at this time period, if it's a period of promise, this time period takes us into Egypt, where most of the family, and as the nation of Israel grew and blossomed, it blossomed in not Israel, not in the land, it blossomed where? In Egypt. Uh, so God was still uh, caring for his nation and wanted the best, but they were, uh, you can't, they couldn't be blessed outside the land. That was the, that's the main thing. So, so what happens is... Um, Many people will look at, well, they were put into slavery as a punishment 
for disobeying God in that period. So the judgment was, was um, what we would call the imprisonment of the nation. But the nation thrived on, in that realm. Um, and if you say, well, that's the punishment, it was a 400-year punishment. I don't know what to do with that in my mind. So I, I'm kind of, so these are the, I'm trying to bring up some of the issues I have with this as we go through this. Um, I, I understand what they're doing and how they break up the time period because as Israel uh, moves out of Egypt and goes into the promised land, which takes us into Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, um, they were still not in the land though. They wandered in the wilderness for another 40 years. So, you know, what, what dispensation do you call that? The dispensation of the sandal? I don't know. I mean, I'm just, because to me, they were still, they, there was a punishment there. Do you re- remember that? They were disgruntled uh, people. They had rebelled. They were obstinate. And God says, now you're going to be punished. You're going to be in the wilderness t- till that generation dies off, except for, anybody ready? Test. Except for two people were allowed to go in. Who? Caleb and Joshua, very good. So, so the whole generation had to die off. I think that's called a punishment. I, I don't know what to do with that. So, the th- the next one w- would be number five. And what I'm doing is taking the conglomeration of dispensationalist understandings, basic, uh, traditional, and classical dispensationalists, because we're going to look at other model later that doesn't even include these kind of thing. Well, one of them. This one's always included uh, because people don't know what to do with the law. Uh, dispensational law was from Moses to the death of Christ. I would say this, just conversation thinking, uh, speaking for this moment that's on my mind, are we not in the dispensation of law still? I mean, just think about it for a minute. Has Christ came to fulfill the law, not to do what? Not to do away with it. Are we responsible to the law? Well, no, not necessarily, but the law's not done until Israel is done, and I think when you look at the tribulation, this law is, is again, the format that they're dealing with. Um, so in, in this, and I'm just using their model, uh, and I'll show you the one verse. We'll, we'll go to, let's go to John 1. Just look what they use for this verse to separate this out. And, you know, it's always problematic to use a verse to build a theology. Okay, so just remember that. Bless you. See, that's truthful. And it's doubly truthful. I got tissues. You need some? Nope. Listen, there's a lot of flu going on. I got a whole thing of Lysol. I'll spray you. This this town's sick. I'm telling you, there's schools that have been canceled. Anyway, where was it? John chapter 1, verse 17 says, The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. It's not splitting things off. It's not saying now the law is no longer and there's only grace and truth because we've always had grace and truth. Grace and truth was realized fully in who? In Christ. But we've always had, if we say this part of the Bible is not truthful and there's no grace, I have issues with that. So don't don't, don't draw a line in the sand sand that's a line of demarcation that you can't go. No. Understand what Christ did as being the Messiah. Okay. And what Moses had done as being the leader of a nation. That's all. Um, and, And don't build something out of that so so again we'll, we'll build further on this and we'll discuss it more when we go into each dispensation uh probably a half a class on each dispensation to dig in a little further um but the but the question is and i always say this we said it's to the remember we went back if you go back a few slides it's to a judgment what is the judgment if the dispensation what's the judgment what, what 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 judgment was Israel put in? Some will say, well, they rejected their Messiah, so they're under a curse, and God's done with the Jew. Do you have an issue with that? I do, personally. <laughs> Some people think it's the cross. cross was a judgment on that dispensation. Um, no, the cross was a judgment on sin. Okay? And, and Christ paid it all. Um, so if we look at Exodus 19. Now, here's the interesting thing. If you went, let's just do this. Go to Exodus 19. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time. I just want to give you something to think about until we get back to explore these a little deeper. But Exodus 19. We'll start in verse 1. And, and the question is, 
in this dispensation was the law given was the law given so the people would obey it and be right with God? You've got to ask yourself that question. Okay? Well, why was the law even given? So verse 1 says this, In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came to the, into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the sons of Israel. Okay? You yourselves have seen what I did, in, did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. In other words, uh, from this time so far, what, what God is saying to Moses is, Can you trust me? Can you trust me? Verse 5 says, now then, if you, you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own possession among all the peoples of all the earth as mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So God had a special purpose for the nation of Israel as they were going into the land. Remember, we're only a couple of months from the uh, plagues of Egypt and the exodus out of there. So Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people answered together. So it was a unanimous vote by the board of Israel. Okay, listen, this is so fun. All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Uh, you have an issue with that, don't you? When was any time period that someone received God's word and all God said they did? There's never been a time period. There's been one person in all of history. What we should have, what they should have said, and what we also should respond, is all these things we cannot do. How can we have a relationship with you when we cannot do these things? They hadn't even heard the, the law because Moses hadn't brought it down. He's just, he's just saying, God's going to tell us to do some things. He wants us to be obedient. He wants us to uh, understand that he's going to keep his covenant with us. And they said, well, we'll do everything he says. And Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And, and the Lord said to Moses, but I shall come to you in a thick cloud in order that people may hear when I speak with you, and they may also believe in you forever. Then Moses told the words of the, pe uh, the people to the Lord. So what we have again is this time period of the law that's specifically to a group of people who said they would what? Do everything God said they would, they would do. So if we want to talk about a, a um, judgment on people, they never did what God said they, they should do. They still haven't done it. And if you want to obey the law as a believer, which I think is not for your benefit, because the whole law is a whole law, not just pieces here and there, uh, you're not going to do it. You're not going to succeed. So when you hear anybody that's kind of legalistic or says we are Christians that think we need to uh, adhere to the Sabbath, understand that ain't happening. That's, you can't pick that one out. Now, if you want to have services on Friday night, Sunday, Saturday, Monday, too, I don't care. But don't say we're obeying or we're doing it because it's the Sabbath. And we're going to burn a couple of Shabbat candles and, and honor the Lord because we're setting this time aside because it's a Sabbath unto the Lord. No, don't do that. Um, there's no nothing given to us for that idea. The next one is the dispensation of grace, uh, death of Christ until the rapture of the church. Revelation only has one V, just so you know. I don't know why it didn't come on a spell check. Um, now you know why I have issues, so... I, I double type. Anyway, the, the idea of dispensation of grace, and, and this, this again is my issue, when has grace not been a part of who God is? God all of a sudden decided in a time frame he would grace us out. Now, is, is grace more understood in this time period? Well, that's obvious. We do have a better understanding of grace, because why? Uh, to whom much is given, much is required. How much of the Bible did Moses have? He was writing how many books? Five. So Moses had, uh, as he was living, writing out five books, and probably not, maybe not, the last chapter, because he's dead. <laughs> so, you know, I think maybe Joshua was recording it and putting it in to the Pentateuch, okay? But he, five books, okay? So he was responsible, and the Israelites at the time, for five books of the Bible. 
We have 66. The last I checked, to whom much is given, much is required. Okay, so there's a the whole different issue going on there. And the reason I put in here, uh, some of them put from the Gospels to Revelation. Uh, that's wrong, cause if, and, and it's usually probably to Revelation 3, um, but because we know from Revelation 4 it's, it's to 20, it's at least the tribulational period. But they do John, it's because, uh, and I do it, because we have to understand the Gospels were in the economy of Israel. Christ had not gone to the cross. Nothing had happened. The only time the church is even mentioned in Matthew, he says, I, upon Peter's statement, I will build my church. So there's not really a church entity at all. There were people that congregated together. Like if you had a town meeting, it was called the ecclesia, so you can have that. Jewish people that got together in a congregation was usually called a synagogue, a synagogue, not necessarily a church. Uh, or an ecclesia. Ecclesia was a group of called out people, really not a church. But So anyway, when we look at the, the dispensation of grace, um, which is fascinating because it supposedly ends in judgment. But as a believer, are you going to be any part of any... Now, my personal opinion, I'm a pre-trib guy. Okay, that means That means I believe in a rapture. Some Christians say you may leave you know, halfway through the tribulation, uh, those are mid-trivers. Uh, then there's post-trivers. Uh, that means after the tribulation's over, then God's going to deal with the church. I'm a pre. So if I'm a pre-guy, I'm figuring we're not going through the judgment. So what's the judgment on the church age? If you're, so it's really not a, it's not a church age per se. It's not a grace age. It's a, it's a pause button for the nation of Israel. Because the, the, the economy of Israel, it goes throughout the whole Bible from the moment they became a nation. So I, know, I don't want to, I know a lot of you are saying, man, he's confusing the heck out of me. Good. We'll, we will clarify the mud as we go through this. I'm just getting you used to terminology. Then there's the dispensation of God's wrath and the tribulation, which if you just noticed, that kind of just, I don't know what happened, kind of overlapped a little. This is from the rapture to the second coming. Now, uh, understand this. Christ is. This is my model that I hold to. Christ is going to come in the air to catch up his believers. Okay, he's not coming to earth. So when we, the tribulation starts, it starts with the calling out of the believers, and then now we're dealing with Daniel's 70th week to Israel. That's why Daniel's here and Joel's here and Matthew 24. Uh, you can write those down when we later expand on these. We'll, we'll be a little bit more thorough on these pictures. But the tribulation is going to be a dis, uh, distinct period of time unlike any time that ever existed in human history. Uh, and I will agree with that. And thank God it only lasts seven years or else the whole world would be wiped out. Okay? Uh, God says that in multiple places. Um, but when we look at this, it's basically... and I. I put in here 19 because 20 is kind of a where is 20 happening. Revelation is an interesting book. We'll cover that when we're done with the other 65. It is at the end of your Bibles, isn't it? Some people think, wow, there's a Revelation conference. I've got to go to it. They know nothing else, but they've got to go to a Revelation conference. And usually a Revelation conference, if you be careful, they're usually held by who? Do you know this? Seventh-day Adventist. That'll nail it. Um, but the issue that you, that you have is there's a lot of figurative language in Revelation. It's not difficult if you know the other 65 books. It comes at the end. Um, then there's the dispensation of the millennium, which is the second coming to the end of a thousand years. Uh, Revelation 20, where at that time Satan will be, is bound and Christ is reigning on earth. From the throne of David during this time, God will fulfill all kingdom promises that he gave to Israel. So Israel is focal no matter what we look at from the tribulation and the millennium because Christ is ruling and reigning from whose throne? Throne of David, which is a good tie-in for this morning because we're going to start in Matthew chapter 1 and deal with the genealogy of Jesus Christ. That's, that works out good. Um, so again, and, and the other issue you might have is what is the judgment at the end of the millennium to change it to another time period or age? Well, the judgment is on who? The nations that are not believers and mainly upon Satan. Okay, so uh, you could call that a judgment if you want. 
Um, but it's not on all mankind. That's, again, the problems that we have. Then there's a dispensation. I don't, wouldn't even call it a dispensation. Some of them do. Uh, new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem. That, this is called eternity future. This is when Jesus takes the kingdom and hands it over to God the Father, and God the Father brings us in, and this, we could just label this eternity. Uh, the word for new is kainos. Uh, it's, it's something that's never existed before. Uh, most of the times when you hear a product that says we're new, it's a product that's been revamped, it's new, and they've got to add the word improved. Okay, this is not new and improved. Uh, Peter talks about how the earth will be done away with fire. Okay, not global warming, God warming, God cooking, um, and then God will recreate a heaven, uh, and I don't think it's his residence, it's the heavenlies, the, the, what we call universes, the new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem will come down, this will be a brand new dispensation. Um, I don't call it a dis. I call it eternity, I don't know what you want to do with that. How's that going to end? It's not, okay? So uh, there's not going to be a judgment that'll end it. Um, again, um, I tend to like certain people that, that, are, that are older. In, if you look at certain commentaries and things from, we went through different time periods. Let, let me, let, let's do it this way. We went through a time period year, uh, about 200 years ago. We were very much, as a nation, our nation, very much evangelistic. A lot of evangelistic societies came out. Some of the Pentecostals, some of the craziness happened about 200 years ago because people wanted to reach people for Christ. And some of the uh, cultic stems of our, you know, what we call Christianity came out of it. But there was a good uh, thrust to get the word out. Then about 100 years later, um, probably the 1850s, there was a great drive to study the Word of God. And if you want to get some solid, deeper books that are that will really teach the Word of God, go get older stuff. Uh, they'll, they'll still through, go through the language studies. They will be more, they will, you see they've given time to think about things. They're even their, what we would call their uh, uh, meditation kind of studies. They're stuff that's personal. They're, they're, they're application is more thought-provoking than it is saying, oh, that makes me feel good kind of thing. Um, their, their in-depthness is crazy. Uh, if you look at I should have brought one out. The writing is smaller because they're trying to get a lot more on one page. Some of them will do, here's what they, uh, if they're doing a book study, they'll say, here's what it says in, in whatever English text they're using. Here's the Greek text. Here is uh, uh, an understanding of the Greek text. Here's an explanation of what it says. And here's the homiletic behind it. Here's what you get out of that. And that's digging. Kind of get what I'm saying? Now you get a commentary. Um, I'm going to do this later too so I, since I'm holding it. That's a commentary in the book of Matthew. You see that. And I'll say this later. But this is by uh, the president of Dallas at one point. Of Dallas Seminary. That's 28 chapters. 20, you understand that? Um, you'll get that today on Matthew chapter 1. Just so you know. But what I'm saying is, um, when we look at things, how they've happened, we're not digging into God's Word anymore. So that's what we're trying to do here, if anything. So I look at some of the dispensational models of the 17 and 1800s. So, one, well, I'll do that in a minute. First of all, if you look at... Uh, and I don't think John Nelson Darby nailed it, but some of the things Darby had back there were very thought-provoking, and what we've come from, how we've come from there, and some of them hold the Darbyism, I guess is the best way to say it. Um, he held the seven dispensations, okay? I'm, I'm not agreeing with him 100%, but what we got today is, is, is issues, but if we just look at his model, since he's one of the earliest that wrote things that I can say, this is what I agree with kind of thing and understand, um, even though I'm kind of different. He, his first one was paradise to the flood. He didn't call it innocence. Or, he just said paradise to the flood. Then he called it Noah. Next one was Noah. Next one was Abraham. Next one was Israel. Next one was Gentiles, which I, I kind of disagree with, but Gentiles. And he doesn't call it, that's not the church. The Gentiles is from the time the kings of Israel stopped ruling, Okay? To the time Christ came. Okay? And the next one is spirit. So I guess we're in the spirit. Uh, and, and then the millennium. Okay? 
Uh, and if you see, there's issues even with his model. And the only reason I'm giving is because some of those other guys thought it through a little differently. Okay, And there's many. We could sit here all day talking about the different strands of dispensations that came out of there. Um, I want you to see this. Um, I don't know. I, I'm going to read it to you because you may not be able to see it. I pulled it off a website. It's pretty funny. This is Hebrew. Okay? And I know you can't read it. And this is uh, Arabic. Now, I'm going to show you how things get lost in translation because if you went to this place, it's a, it's a uh, pool. Rules for the pool. How to did, how did bathe in this pool. First one says, it, the, the translation of this title says, De- Debt Bather. I don't know what a debt bather is, but I'm not owing anybody for anything going in water. But that's what it says. The first rule, the first rule here, it says, Siren Pool Officials Instructions Signs. What does that mean? So if I'm going to this pool, I'm going, what are they talking about? Because, see, what happens is they held to a little translation, not an understanding that they could apply to, the, uh, to a different language. Second one says, beware, slip in ponds in the vicinity, not allowed to run and push. So we know what that is. No running around the pool. Okay, we, we got that one, right? Third one, parent lenders, parents lenders, you watch the kids wash up to six years of age, to, age toddlers, knees, there are no saves. What? In other words, put your kid in the pool, let him drown. We're not getting them. <laughs> I have no idea. Please note, so the last thing is, is notice. Please note, providence is eye contact or physical proximity, contagiousness with bather, allow, allow intermediate territory of help. Now, I'm going to say this. If you visit Israel, please get somebody that can trans. Go, go use your Google. <laughs> what does that say? Um, but that's an actual sign at a pool in Israel. And I said, that's pretty funny because what we deal with is how to translate things so we can understand it from a language that's very different than ours. And that's what you do when you, when you look at these different models is what is it? What's being said? What's being said? Who's being spoken to? What's the uh, theme of whatever's being written? So when we talk about this, let's talk about divisions of dispensations. When you divide them, how would you do that? Well, the first thing I would look at is who's being spoken to. I think that's more important than uh, anything else. So we know from Genesis 1 to 11, God's speaking to the world. Now, somebody will say this. He's speaking to Gentiles only. There is no Gentile without a Jew. I don't know about you. That's how I think. The Gentiles only came about after the Jews were called out from what? The world. So God's dealing with the world, uh, no specific entity whatsoever. He's dealing, and how does he mediate that? That, I think that's important. How does God mediate that? He usually has, and God is always working in every time frame with a mediator. So you look at this time period. I didn't put them up here. Genesis 1 to 11, who's his mediators? First he has Adam, right? 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 Then we go through history. He may have had Enoch for a while, since Enoch walked with God and he was no more. Uh, then he has Noah. Then Abraham, uh, then Abraham comes after that, but that's it. Those are kind of the mediators. God talks to them, they talk to the people. I don't know if you know this, Noah's time on the ark, building it, was a time to talk to the people. It was a great time. He's building an ark in the middle of where? Never, but never been done before. And if you don't realize this, you're going to draw a crowd when you do something crazy in the middle of nowhere. And those people would say, hey, Noah, what you doing? Noah says, I'm building an ark. A flood's coming. God's going to send a judgment. Why? So Noah is the mediator. Kind of get what I'm saying? Okay, next period of time would be, and I, uh, uh, um, we could probably pull this apart and look at it, but Genesis 12 To parts of the gospel. And the reason I say parts of the gospels, because obviously when the cross comes, things are starting to change. Okay? So I would say most of the cross. God is dealing with the Jew and through the Jew as the mediator nation. Now it's their kingdom of priests. Priests are mediators between God and man. Right? Okay? And also the prophet, which is a mediator between man and God and man. The other one's man and God. Okay? Priests are man and God. So he has these two offices of mediators the only way to meet god 
The only way to approach God is through the nation of Israel. So that's a, a good understanding. And when we talk about dispensation, it's about more about people groups than it is about times. Kind of get what I'm saying? The third group would be end of the Gospels to the rapture. God is now, who's God's mediator? The church. Kind of fits better, doesn't it, so far? The church is the mediator. And the mediator, in this instance, we're bringing people to who? Christ. Kind of get what's going on? So, mediators. I think it's an important thing. Tribulation. Who's the mediator in the tribulation? Church is gone. And I'm going to say this. This is food for thought. When the church is raptured, the church is no more. There's no reason for the church anymore. So when God is working with the Jew, and the Jew is bringing people, and if you, if you know anything about Ezekiel, guess what's going to be set up? During this, this probably towards the end of the tribulation in the millennium, there's going to be another temple set up. For the bre- reason of bringing people to the Lord, the Jew is going to bring, and if you read Z- Zechariah, Zechariah says people reach out to grab onto a Jew to be brought to God. So it's kind of an interesting perspective. We have millennial kingdom. Who's the medi- mediator of this kingdom? Christ. He's going to be sitting on the throne. He's going to rule and to reign. He's going to be judge. He's the, so we're talking about Christ. And the eternal state will be God. The triune God will be the mediator in the eternal state. So the basic approach in different times, God runs his house with different rules, with different, through different mediators. So that's my model that I hold to. In different times, God runs different rooms of his house by a, diff, by a different mediator. And you could see that clearly, I think. I think that's a better understanding, because how do we get to God? The main thing is how do we, I think that everybody's big question, how is someone saved? Isn't that important? And the mediator is the one that brings people to God. How is it brought to God? Right now we need Christ to bring us, right? And the church is the one that offers up, should be, a clear gospel, right? Um, so that's the basic approach. Uh, another view would, would be just as simple as you can. Uh, pre-law, law, grace, kingdom, eternity. I think that, again, boxes us in. I don't want to be boxed into a place that says there's rules, there's tests, that man will fail inevitably, and it's necessarily a time frame. I don't know if that's how... If you look at this book as the unfolding drama of God's redemption for man, you're not going to look at it as time frames, how God's working in that as a, and as an age. Um, I think it's more of working through a mediator. So let's the importance of a dispensational approach. And I think, if anything, I want, before we get in next week to covenant theology... I want to end with this. Why is it so important that we have a dispensational approach, not a dispensational model, and that we hold to certain things? Um, I don't even know, and maybe this is, pastor needs to get better informed. I don't remember, at least, if our Constitution holds to a, a dispensational model and what it is. But I will say this. You should see what's going on, and here's what we should hold to. First of all, Do I have it up there? First of all, dispensationalism recognizes biblical distinctions. I think that's so important. There's there's something different going on in different periods. So why? Why is it different? What about the law? What about grace? What's different about them? What's going on? Why is it talking about Israel and the church who I hold as they're distinct? They're not the same. Nothing's been replaced. They're distinct. So that's why when people say, why are you a dispensationalist? Because I believe in that. I believe there's a difference between the rapture and the second coming. So there's distinctions there. That's as basic as I can go with that. Secondly, dispensationalism sees the Bible as progressive revelation. Progressive. To whom much is given, much is required. So how much did, and we could do this again, Adam have, how much did Noah have, how much did Abraham have, how much did Samuel have, how much did David have, God, da, 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 okay? Uh, and how much did they adhere to it? You know Jesus took the Old Testament and told the disciples on the road to Emmaus all about himself, okay? So they didn't even have the Gospels. Uh, just think that one through. Dispensationalism uses a proper hermeneutic. And what I mean by that is we look at things literal, Grammatical, cultural, historical, 
into which to interpret the word of God. Um, go with me to Matthew real quick. Wait up a few minutes. Go to Matthew chapter 4. Since we're studying Matthew, we could look at this a little bit. And we could, we could pull anything out, but verse 12 says this, Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. And when he heard that, that John had, had been taken into custody, he withdrew to Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, he came and settled in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulon and Naphtali. Okay, now just, just think with me for a minute. Is anything unclear about that? Why is it clear? Because we're looking at it literally. It's literal places. We can understand it grammatically that he withdrew from Galilee to leave and leaving Nazareth. So he's doing something. Something's happening. He's moving, right? We could see culturally something's going on because we, if we took the whole text, we know uh, that what happened, what happened culturally, why did John get taken into custody? We can look into that, that kind of thing. And we know this is a historical event. The reason I'm saying that is because if we take these verses at face value, we should be able to take all verses at face value. We can't say, okay, that literally means this, but now we go to a text a few feet away and say, well, that doesn't literally mean that. It means this figuratively. No, don't do that. Uh, understand. Uh, now, I'm going to read you Cooper's Rules. David Cooper came out with a huge series of books years ago when they could write. Um, he came out with volumes about Messiah. And he wrote one of these things, and most guys that I know hang on to these rules of interpretation. You ready for this? It's pretty easy. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context, studied in light of the related passages and axiomatic and fundamental truths, indicate... Uh, clearly otherwise. In other words, be students of the Word. And if it says something in there and it says, okay, for instance, Paul in Galatians will say this is an allegory. So what's Paul talking about? In that little section, I'm going to tell you a story that can be applied to this. But the rest of that is not allegorical. It's historical. It's factual. It's grammatical. So in other words, we can just Listen, I don't think anybody in here would take a, a secular novel and read it allegorically unless it was what? An allegory. You read it and you say, okay, I understand, I understand the, the drama that's in here. I understand the characters. I understand the flow of history of, of the book. I understand the interaction of characters. You're not going to say, well, I think there's a, the author's definitely got more of a deeper meaning than the casual reading. Maybe I should go back and read this fictional book a little deeper. You know, you don't do that. Uh, so why do that to the Bible? The other thing dispensations hold to is they focuses on the glory of God within the flow of human history. We want to focus on God's glory. It's about God's glory. It's not about man. When we go to the Word of God, it's about Him, not us. Um, one of the things covenant theology will do is, is basically beat the idea as we've been elect since the foundation of the world. Well, that makes man focus. And first of all, Never use the word for elect for anybody in the church. It has nothing to do with you. Quit stealing words and making them applicable to you. That's not this time period. Sorry, I'm going to get you know, my bully. Uh, we got a few minutes. Okay. Dispensationalism reminds believers today of the incredible blessing in this time in which they live. I think that's a good place to hold on to and grab and understand. Um, did I write that? Okay, n later. Um, nothing prior to this time... Uh, we could say this, nothing to this time period that we're in now, this immediate uh, age that we're in, where the church in Christ, no one in the Old Testament was ever called in Christ. No one was ever empowered by the Holy Spirit to do ministry. Uh, uh, there was no avail avail uh, ability to allow sin not to rule or to rule. We know that. So something is different in this time period. And we can be priests... Only for this reason, we have immediate access to the throne of God when we pray. I don't have to go to anybody. Think that through for a few minutes. Um, we can pray, and have, we, we have direct access to God the Father as we pray. So we're going to do this. We're going to pray and go get coffee. <laughs> Father God, we thank you for this time. Again, a blessing to 
uh, discuss a theological model, but help us again, uh, our mainstay is to be biblical, to pull out the understanding of how we look at Scripture and how we read Scripture and how it's uh, uh, applied from an understanding of, of the one one interpretation that we should get out of it. And Father, we thank you for this time in Jesus' name. Amen.